uh, welcome to the Navigating COVID-19 webinar for the Kansas City film industry. Um, as most of you know, or all of you know, I'm Steph with the Kansas City Film Office, and we're really grateful for your attendance today. And we're also really grateful for our presentation partners, uh, BIC Media and E2E, uh, supporting our local industry right now in every way that we can is our highest priority. Um, so this free webinar idea was proposed to us from BIC Media. So let me um, ask Austin Bickford to introduce uh, our presentation partner E to E. Austin? Yeah. Uh, hi again, everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining. Thank you, Steph. Um, so uh, BIC Media has worked with E to E for, for the last year, and they really quickly became uh, one of our most valuable resources. Uh, so we use E to E for outsourced CFO services, uh, bookkeeping assistance, uh, and a host of HR services. So um, they, they've just been uh, outstanding the, the whole time, especially since this coronavirus has hit uh, and, and helping us to just be, be prepared, understand what's going on in, in the, the landscape uh, from, the, from a business perspective. Uh, and especially helpful in getting us prepared to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we were able to be first in line uh, with their help, uh, which has really helped us to, uh, you know, just kind of keep keep things going and uh, and have a, a base of stability. And they've also done a great job of connecting us with outside resources, uh, you know. Some some government, uh, some not to uh, to help navigate things, and uh, so hopefully uh, with their help, we're going to be able to come out of this stronger than ever. Um, that's that's the hope anyway. I think uh, for all of us. So we really just wanted to to share the opportunity that we had gotten with the rest of the industry. I think it's really important to us to have a strong film community here. Uh, you know, we depend on independent contractors to execute our jobs and. Uh, and, and so to, to make sure that all you guys have uh, resources uh, to, to help get through this and uh, be able to continue to be an awesome part of a, of a healthy and growing film community is, is our goal here. So just wanted to, uh, to share uh, this information with you and, and introduce you to E2E. To e. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll introduce uh, Nandy, Nancy McCullough and uh, Ray Pericola from, from E2E to e, who've uh, uh, so generously agreed to present. So uh, I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Nancy. Thanks all. Thanks, Austin. Uh, we're glad to be joining you, this creative community. Uh, it's kind of fun for us. It's um, different from the kind of work that we do. Uh, hopefully we can bring some good kind of tips and information to you. Uh, so EDE, just quick about us. I know Austin said some things. Uh, we provide services in three areas, uh, finance and accounting, HR, human resources, and marketing. And so we work with small businesses, typically companies under 100 employees, trying to really kind of help level the playing field and get them some really great sort of CFO and HR executive and, and marketing executive resources. So, um, so anyway, we have been um, in deep on understanding all the different legislation that's happened in the various stimulus packages and working with our base of clients. Um, we currently work with about 70 different companies on a very day-to-day -day basis as kind of their back office for those areas I talked about. So anyway, we're, we're going to jump in and get into some of what the legislation has been. And I understand that the group here is a combination of maybe some, some businesses as well as some sort of self-employed uh, independent contractors and gig workers. And so hopefully we can address kind of all those areas and then take questions and try to get you some specific information. Uh, please know that the guidance changes very regularly, and so even as I share this information, there will be updates and clarifications that will come. So if you're going to take any of this information away and try to implement some of these things, we would still really advise you to make sure you're talking with professional advisors as you go. So I'm going to I'm going to go through about half the presentation, some of the background, and then Ray is going to jump in. So Ray actually is the outsource CFO for Big Media and has worked with Austin and his team through this whole kind of um, stimulus uh, disaster relief process. So with that, I'm gonna throw up a, a quick presentation here uh, that has a lot of information in it and we are um, 
Let me see here. We are um, trying to get to my slideshow here. We are uh, recording this, so you'll have a chance to be able to go back and see any of the slides that maybe you missed or want to take a deeper look at. So um, we're talking about na navigating kind of through COVID-19 here. And so just some quick history and background about where we've been. So phase one, March 4th, they released some information on the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act. It basically was $8.3 in emergency funding for federal agencies, and then some vaccine development, medical supplies, grants for public agencies. So it didn't apply to small businesses much um, at all until phase two happened. Um, Fairly quickly after that, March 18th, um, you've probably have heard the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This seemed to focus more on employees. Um, it was free testing. It was it addressed paid leave for anyone who might need to take time off due to COVID. Um, some food security and some increased Medicaid funding. Uh, then came Phase Three, which is what we all got excited about. Some real relief coming on the coming our way, and that was the CARES Act, so Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. That act was a two trillion dollar relief bill. This is where the stimulus checks are coming from, where the increased unemployment um, provisions are coming from. There was a hundred billion for hospitals and health providers, and then five hundred billion in loans. Uh, and 32 billion in grants to airline industry. So what we're gonna focus on primarily are kind of the loan offerings that came as part of the CARES Act. So in kind of round one, which was that first act I talked about, there were a few things. There, were, um, there was an economic injury disaster loan that was made available. That program has not turned out to be as promising as at first appeared. So what I have on this slide is very summarized. Originally, this was potentially loans up to $2 million at a very low interest rate. It has turned out to be a limit of about 10,000 for any one company and more of a emergency advance that you could get fairly quickly. Um, and it was, they ended up kind of limiting it as a, at 1,000 per employee up to $10,000, which is forgivable. Um, it is unclear whether, well, all of this money has been deployed, um, but they are looking at a new package um, that I'll talk about later. So right now there's no more money available under this economic injury disaster loan, but it's still important to know about it because I think they're gonna, they're gonna end up approving additional funding for this. I don't think there are any real loans available under this. I think it's turned into an emergency advance only. Um, one of the second thing that came out of it was the Paycheck Protection Program. And so, um, hang on a second, yep. Paycheck Protection Program, this came out of phase three. Uh, this, folks that are self-employed, independent contractors, full proprietors, businesses under 500 employees that were in business prior to February 15th are all eligible under this program. Again, this money ran out uh, last week. Uh, but they are looking at approving additional funding under this program, so it's good to know about this too. This is the program that Vic Media was able to take advantage of. It's still very promising. It's helped a lot of businesses so far. They've deployed the 500 million in about um, 1.7 million loans. <clears throat> Average loan size under this program was 206,000, and 75% of the loans made under this program were under 150,000. So really focused on small businesses. Um, the lender in this case are banks that are SBA certified. And the purpose is to cover primarily eight weeks of payroll and medical benefits, um, also retirement contributions, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities. And the formula basically for how much the loan would be is two and a half times your average monthly payroll. They're typically looking at the 2019 calendar year to come up with that, although there are some variations. Um, and you can get up to 10 million, but you heard me say the average loan has been about 150,000 or 200,000, and the majority of the loans were under 150. Um, payroll for any individual is capped at 100,000. So for any individual employee, you can only um, base the average monthly payroll on up to 100,000 of their payroll. Uh, and then this is, this has a uh, provision in it that a good majority of the loan can be forgivable if it is used for payroll and, and the rent and the mortgage interest and utilities. 
um, do, and, and there's, a, there's a formula and a calculation for that, and we're still waiting on clear guidance on that calculation. So we're still not 100% sure how to calculate the forgiveness, but um, if it is used in that way, it is primarily forgivable. If, it, if not forgiven, if not used in that manner, you can still take the funds and use them how you like, but it will convert to a loan over two years at a 1% interest rate. Still a pretty favorable interest rate. We do have some clients that are making decisions about whether they need the cash flow post COVID kind of this period of time and whether to really use it on payroll or save it and be sure they can have employees return to jobs um, after the stay at home orders are, are over. Uh, the another um, program under the small business relief program in the phase three was the small business debt relief. Uh, this was anyone who was already a borrower with an SBA loan that was a 7A, 504, or a micro loan. The SBA has basically covered uh, six months of principal interest and fees on those loans. It was automatic. There was nothing you needed to apply for. If you had one of these loans and you have not received a letter about all of the principal and interest and fees being forgiven for the next six months, reach out to your lender because that should have happened already and it should have been automatic. Ooh. Another option under the program is the employee retention credit. Um, this one I, has, there's been some discussion, but people I don't think have heard as much about it. This is also employers, um, this is eligible, businesses are eligible for this, but are employers that have employees. If your operations have been fully or partially suspended, or if you've seen a greater than 50% reduction in your quarterly gross receipts year over year. So if you compare the most recent quarter to the prior year, most recent quarter, if you've had more than a 50% de decrease in your revenue, you can qualify under this program and you continue to qualify under it until you hit a quarter, until the quarter following a quarter where your gross receipts are now kind of have returned to 80% of the prior quarter. This program is available through the end of this year. And, and what it does is for any employees that you have, you can basically take a 50% tax credit against their wages and health benefits up to $10,000. So essentially 5,000 per employee up to 100 employees. And you can get credit for those wages. And it's, it's pretty quick and automatic. You can, most of the payroll companies have worked this into their offerings and you can take the credit against the employee federal withholdings and employer, um, employee and employer FICA and Fed withholdings. So you essentially just reduce the tax deposits that you're making. And if the credit is higher than that, there's a form that you can complete to get further credit. And we'll talk more about that later. But this is an opportunity, um, have to be careful with this and the PPP program, can't have crossover. Um, there's still some guidance we're waiting to see if this can be taken advantage of um, after the PPP loan, which really ends at the end of June or the eight week period after disbursement. Um, the last uh, kind of opportunity for self-employed independent contractors and gig workers is the pandemic, pandemic unemployment assistance. And so this is the unemployment that is specific to COVID-19. So you can go up anytime you lose a job, you can apply for unemployment. Um, you get a limited amount of unemployment. They've added $600 per week to it for folks that are losing employment related to COVID. This is available from March 29th of 2020 through July 25th of 2020. When you apply, the benefits are retroactive to when you were negatively affected. Um, you have to be able to provide proof of employment. So if you're self-employed, independent contractor, gig worker, you've got to be able to show a business card or a business license, um, some kind of proof of earnings, a tax return with you know, one of the schedules or a form 1099 miscellaneous that can help them see that you were employed and actively working prior to this. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ray and let him walk through some of the lessons that we learned as we got into this program with a lot of the lack of guidance and um, things that we sort of had to figure out and work through to understand how to apply for the programs. Ray? Okay, great. Thanks, Nancy, and thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, definitely an exciting time to be a, a financial person and, and working through this. And as Nancy said, uh, 
all of the guidance and lack of guidance related to these programs is, is fast and furious and coming from various different sources. So um, definitely had, we had a lot of lessons uh, from this first round of, of funding and programs and hopefully uh, you can benefit from some of the lessons we learned and, and get ahead of the curve, uh, hopefully on some of these next ones. Uh, one thing I, I will say is be aggressively patient. Uh, apply now, get in front of these programs, like Nancy said, uh, some of the disaster loan funding and uh, the payroll protection program funding. And some of those things have been expired, but more help hopefully is on the way. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the rules change, but generally they're, they're the same. Uh, depending on your bank, the lender requirements vary. So it's important if you have good relationships with your bankers and with your banks, get ahead of that, understand what they're looking for because there are nuances there and the more prepared that you are, uh, the, the better your process is, is going to go. I know with Big Media and, and Austin and Julian can attest to this, we, we had more documents initially than we probably needed and that's okay. Uh, you're, you're much better off having that in advance. And, and if you don't need it, you don't need it. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, be a squeaky wheel. Don't get lost in the pile. Uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. I've seen that. Uh, I've seen a few horror stories with clients where because they followed up and because they were aggressively patient with this process, uh, they didn't get lost in the pile and, and they avoided uh, some big missteps on, on behalf of the banks. Uh, banks are treading new water right now. And uh, well, like I said, there's there's some lack of guidance and, and other items. You just don't want to be a statistic if, if there's a mistake somewhere, somewhere in the process. And then uh, visit the state employment websites, the, some of the PUA funding and those items. I know there's been a lot of press about these uh, unemployment websites crashing uh, just from the uh, the overwhelming load on them. I know a lot of those things have been hopefully addressed. Uh, I know folks are very hard to get on the phone, especially talking remotely, but that's where the best source of information is. If you're in Kansas, obviously the Kansas site, Missouri, uh, Missouri site and, and others as, as applicable. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, the, the funding for the disaster loans and the Triple P program ran out uh, on tax day, but additional funding is expected this week. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, the debt relief under the different types of SBA loan programs should be automatic. If for some reason you have one of those and you haven't heard from your lender, uh, go ahead and give them a call and, and figure out maybe what's going on. Uh, the employee retention credit is available through the end of the year and the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance PUA uh, is available through midsummer, J July 25th. Uh, this next round of funding that's coming out, $450 billion program, uh, great news that $310 billion of that is for the Triple P CARES Act program that a lot of companies, a lot of individuals are going to be taken advantage of. Small amount for the disaster loans and another 100, 100 billion split for uh, hospitals and testing. Uh, it's, moving through, uh, it's moving through the legislature, passed the Senate yesterday. It's expected to be in the House and, and have a vote on Thursday. Again, lessons learned, apply, apply, apply. Get ahead of the, get ahead of the requirements. Um, a lot of people are already in line. So if you're not in line right now, uh, get in line. Uh, get, get your various lenders bank requirements, gather the documentation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Probably get more than you need at the ready. And then, um, and then be, be ready to submit or you know, get, get in process. Uh, how the request is calculated, uh, as Nancy mentioned, you take the gross payroll for, for 2019, you remove any salaries for folks uh, over 100,000. I don't mean remove the whole salary, just the portion that's over 100,000. 
you get to add back to that any amounts that have been paid by the company for any insurance amounts, that's medical and dental and vision, anything related to healthcare savings accounts or retirement funding, again, on behalf of the company. And you add back also any amounts that were paid by the employer for state or local unemployment taxes, for instance, Missouri unemployment tax, and then for self-employment, uh, for owners, they, they get to uh, calculate 83, roughly 8,300 bucks per person. You add all those amounts up and, and subtract as necessary. Uh, you take that, you divide it by 12, and you multiply that by two and a half, and that's the amount of your loan request. And again, a big portion of that is intended to be eight weeks of payroll coverage, and Nancy talked about the uh, forgiveness requirements or um, you know potential forgiveness requirements the intent of a lot of this is to be used to cover payroll costs um, there are there are amounts that can be utilized for mortgage interest and for basic utilities things like that but the lion's share of this type of program will be forgiven appropriately if it's used for um, to cover payroll costs and there's not big decreases either in terms of amounts that are being paid to folks or uh, headcount reductions, things like that. But more to come as, as the rules are, are shifting around a bit. Uh, that, that was for businesses. If you're a sole proprietor, an independent contractor, which I know a lot of folks are, uh, you take your 2019 net earnings from the Form 1040 uh, that's on uh, Schedule C, line 31. And if you're lucky enough to earn oh. over a hundred thousand dollars, every time that's capped, um, and it's divided by by 12 and multiplied by two and a half to to figure out that amount. Uh, again, we talked about this, but definitely some of the major items that are going to absolutely be required. Uh, if you're a business going after uh, the triple P application or the the program is going to be that application that's out there. It's on it's on the website. Uh, it's it's on any of your bank websites as well. They're going to be asking for payroll registers. It's basically all of the details surrounding each payroll run each month uh, for each employee, so that folks can understand uh, what exactly is being paid to who and when. Uh, that all has to tie into the what's called the 941 reports, and those are filed with the federal government. And again, that's just more summarized detail of what's going on with the business as it relates to all of their payroll funding and amounts. Uh, to substantiate the amounts that are being paid for benefits and, and, um, and retirement contributions, the various statements from the insurance companies or the contribution advices that are that are uh, submitted to the the trustee for retirement contributions. Those types of of documents are are required, as well as uh, employee identification number uh, documentation and any uh, incorporation, state incorporation, uh, various bylaws to uh, make sure that the lenders understand uh, the nature of the business, the company, who can. Uh, who can take on debt on behalf of the company? Because again, this is this is debt. Um, so there's there's rules and regulations associated with that that, that folks are going to be looking for the banks. Uh, for self-employed individuals and independent contractors, uh, again, there's there's the triple P application, uh, the 1040 Schedule C. I know a lot of folks haven't filed uh, Schedule Cs and, and 1040s yet, especially with the delay in filing that's been extended to July 15th. But if you haven't filed uh, your tax return, your 2019 tax return, go ahead and get your Schedule C done because uh, the, the lenders are gonna be looking for that. They're also gonna be looking for uh, forms 1099 uh, miscellaneous and in any invoices to support the amounts that are on that Schedule C and the amounts that are running through your business. And then any statements or records establishing truly that your business was, was in operation and, and functioning on February 15th of this year. That's one of the, the cutoff dates that's important for this process.
let's see. Uh, Nancy, is there a, is, I noticed there was a chat. Is, is it something we should address now or after afterwards? Um, I think we just have an, maybe one or two more slides and we can probably then take all the questions. Okay, very good. You know, in terms of, of how to apply for the disaster loans, once that uh, program is back up and running, assuming it's funded, it's a fairly simple online application. It takes about 20 minutes to complete. As Nancy mentioned earlier, the debt relief, if you have an SBA type loan is automatic. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't received anything yet, check with your lender. Uh, the employee retention credit, one of the benefits of this is you can keep the cash that the business already has by not uh, remitting those funds that are normally remitted straight to the government for payroll taxes. And if the amounts that you hold back and keep aren't sufficient, you can file this form 7200 and ask for more funds uh, related to this particular program. And then uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance funds, those are each applied through uh, via the state website and they're gonna be asking for proof of employment and that could be uh, business cards, business licenses, things like that. Any proof of earnings uh, that, you've, that you've had in the past and that you've lost, um, those tax returns, those various schedules that, that Nancy mentioned, probably one of the most important being schedule, schedule C or any K-1s or 1099s that you're getting in, in accordance with your business are also going to be very important for folks to be uh, looking at and, and supporting your, your claims and your, uh, your applications. So hopefully, again, that's helpful. Uh, stay tuned. This this landscape is is constantly changing. Um, more funding's coming down the pike, and you know, I guess the last thing I would mention. A lot of this was from a business perspective and a um, you know sole proprietorship or independent contractor perspective. From a personal financial standpoint. Uh, also, take advantage of things potentially that, that might be out there and available to you. Uh, I know some insurance companies are reducing insurance rates. Uh, some financial institutions are relaxing uh, re requirements in terms of mortgages and things like that. If, if you're not able to, to uh, pay bills on time, one of the keys is to stay ahead of that and stay in contact with, with your local lenders and financial institutions don't don't get behind, behind the curve stay ahead and then the, the last thing that i would mention too we're in very uncertain times right now but one backstop that i wouldn't recommend right off the bat but depending on an individual situation may be something to take advantage of i know the irs is looking at uh, relaxing requirements to tax deferred retirement accounts. That's 401ks and IRAs and not take not making people pay uh, the 10% early withdrawal penalties if, if folks truly get in a bad line. So again, not, not stuff, I would rather play offense and go after uh, these other types of programs that we talked about, but definitely um, gotta understand defensive plays as well. And with that, I will uh, turn it back over. And again, thanks, thanks for uh, allowing us to to share some information uh, via this webinar. So Ray and Nancy, this is Lori, and we have a few questions for you guys, and I'm gonna gather those and, and read those out to you, and then either one of you answer. Um, a lot of the folks on the call are independent contractors, and uh, they have both 1099 and W-2 income. Uh, about 85% of one person's income is a 1099. They qualified for unemployment at a ridiculously low weekly rate based on the W-2 income. Will this person be able to get the $600 weekly stimulus for being self-employed? Uh, yes, so you should be able to, what I'm understanding from the various websites, and of course every state's gonna be a little bit different. Missouri has quite a bit of information on their website, Kansas not as much. But my understanding is you go through the typical unemployment channel, they, they, and you can show them your W-2 income. They may even deny you if you have no W-2 income, and then they will kick you over into this PUA program, which is the pandemic 
um, unemployment that is also for independent contractors, gig workers, and self-employed. And that is where you should be able to substantiate your income and take advantage of the, the full unemployment. I don't know, Ray, do you have any other details on that that I didn't mention? Did we lose Ray? We may have. I lost his picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. that, that's my understanding of how the unemployment is working. But yes, you do qualify. I, I don't know how easy it is to get a hold of the states and sort of fight your way through that, but you do qualify. And so um, I think just clarifying the PUA is better for independent contractors than the PPP on a standard basis or you know if independent contractors pay themselves a set fee each month but pay their quarterly taxes um, would ppp work best for them um so i think between ppp and pua you would have to kind of take a look i mean it, it's telling you basically what the weekly income is it's 600 plus whatever you can substantiate as sort of a, a normal earnings um, but they also have a limit on that. The PPP is going to look at two and a half times um, what your what an average monthly income is. So if you look back at a 2019 and what you made over the course of the year, on average, you can have you can have you would divide that by 12 and take it times two and a half. And so I would look at which program you think um, is a better opportunity. Um, you know, you're obviously not paying unemployment back. You shouldn't be paying PPP back either. A large portion of it should be forgivable, but they are forgiving the amount spent over an eight week period, yet they're taking two and a half times of payroll. So if you don't have enough rent and utilities to make up the difference, there could be a small amount that turns into a loan. But I can't necessarily tell you which program is better. I would just encourage you to look at both and do the calculations and see which one you think you could take better advantage of. The unemployment, I don't think, is going to run out. <laughs> the PPP funds may be hard to get, and the unemployment you may be able to take over a longer period of time. So uh, next question is, uh, last year I had a couple of jobs where I, as a freelancer, had to be hired as a temp employee based on the process that company used. They took the taxes out and sent me a W-2 at the end of the year. How does that affect the numbers that I would be reporting for the PPP loan, or does it? Lori, I may need you to repeat the middle part of that again. Unless, Ray, did you get all that? So the, so the question was, there, there was a, a freelance individual and was hired as an employee, temporary employee, and, and had W-2 wages from, from that particular company. And so the question is, how, how does that impact the numbers that he would be applying for, he or she, uh, from, for the PPP loan? Um, Basically, I would say that if you have W-2 wages, um, typically the employer is going, if they were going after uh, triple P funding, they would be uh, looking at those types of wages that are reported on a W-2 for their own purposes. Uh, you would be looking at as your, your freelance income. I don't know the splits. It's probably a little more to the question, but I don't know the split if if eighty percent of your earnings were as, as that freelancer and ten ninety nine type wages. Um, you know, I, I would I would say you would look at maybe both of them, but definitely if if it's eighty twenty, where eighty percent is the ten ninety nine type wages, that's probably uh, the amount that they're going to be looking at. I believe you can apply both for a PPP and unemployment. So I think you could apply for unemployment for the W-2 and a PPP for your 1099, but that still may or may not be more lucrative or, or less lucrative than just applying for unemployment for both the W-2 and the self-employment earnings. So here's another question. Uh, well, there's a series of questions. Um, I'm an independent contractor, freelance, makeup artist, stylist, just applied for the PPUC. I have questions regarding what do I fall under, gig worker or independent contractor? That's the first question. Do tax returns suffice for 2019? And do we get a pin separate of the pin regular UC people get? 
Okay, I'm not sure I can answer the pin question. I, I have not been through that process and I've not been asked that before. So unless Ray has something to offer on that, I don't know about the pin part of it. Um, in terms of the gig worker or the independent contractor, to me, those are, are very similar. Both get paid on 1099s typically. And, um, and so they look very similar. I think, you know, in my opinion, the only real difference is sometimes an independent contractor has set up sort of a, a business and a gig worker may or may not have. Um, I tend to see maybe gig workers sometimes getting W-2 and sometimes 1099, um, but I can say I've seen that on independent contractor too. So I feel like that's splitting hairs. And if they're asking the question, I tend to think of the gig worker more as somebody who is literally picking up gigs, gigs as opposed to like setting out a business of with maybe a website and business cards and what have you. Ray, do you have anything on that you wanna add? No, I think I think you you covered that that uh, Nancy. Okay, my next question is in regards to the PPP. I am the only employee of my own LLC that files an S corp, but without formal payroll to show. I am managing cash flow, cash flow like I did as a sole proprietor, but do have a bank account to show deposits for income. Does it sound like I can still qualify PPP with my bank? My CPA thought not, but want to be sure. Yes, I do believe that you absolutely can qualify under PPP. Um, you're, you're incorporated, so you're an LLC, and you've elected S-Corp status. You've got self-employment income, so that would be coming through on a K-1. And so your K-1 should substantiate your income, even if it's not on a Schedule C. Um, because I think you would apply, you can apply as a company, as a business, as opposed to self-employed, because you've got, you've got an incorporated business. Um, I will just caution that if, if you have an S Corp, the, the IRS actually requires that you pay yourself a W-2 wage that is a, that's reasonable compensation. They don't really want to see you um, distributing all your compensation to yourself as distributions. They expect you to pay payroll. Um, and so I don't know if your CPA is advised on that. And I don't know how much self-employment earnings is in that, but you should be, and you might want to look at that. I, I doubt this would flag it because I think everybody's too busy to look at these in any detail and who's really looking at this is the bank. So I would still encourage you to apply for the PPP, but you may want to talk with your CPA about whether you're paying yourself appropriately through an S corporation. Ray, do you have anything to add on that? No, that I think you nailed that one, Nancy. Can I, can I say something real quick? Uh, yes, is that Claudia? Yeah. Yes, hi. <laughs> Um, on, and not on this question, but on the previous question, um, in regards to the gig worker and the independent contractor, the question was primarily asked because it's a trick question in the PP uh, UC uh, application where there's an area where it allows you to put independent contractor and then there's another area where it gives you a selection of choices and independent contractor is not one of them. And so the only thing that you could fall under is gig worker. So that was primarily the question was because it was posed as, as kind of like a trick question, not knowing which one to, to answer. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I can see if I can get any additional information on that and we okay. can maybe find a way to get it out to participants. I'm not sure why they're trying to draw that distinction unless they're just trying to gather data about the types of workers. Because right. I, I know they kind of put gig workers in a separate category. To me, they look very much the same as an independent contractor. You still get 1099s, you file, you know, the same right. type of return. But so I'm not and, really and sure just, what they're looking for. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to shed a little bit of light on the person who asked the question about the 1099 and the W-2s. Um, if you have filed, or actually, if the employer that has the W-2s has filed, the they will see that w-2 and will question the w-2s that you're not putting as just the 1099 so even if it's one w-2 they will then come the, the website will come back and ask you did you work for so and so for this amount and they'll ask you so just check and make sure that the that that employer that is giving you the w-2 is actually the employer that you did work for and that the address is correct, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Lori, do you have more? I do. One more question here. The alt cap loans for KCMO, do you know anything about those? Um, I do not have many details on the alt cap loans. I, I did know they had a program available, but I've not um, looked into it too deeply. Ray, have you had an opportunity to do that for any clients? I, I have not. Okay. Yeah, I know there are some other various loan programs and offerings and assistance out there um, that I know there's been some things that have been put together for the nonprofit kind of industry and a few others but I don't know the specifics around them. A lot, a lot to stay on top of. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not seeing any other questions from anyone. Um, a chat over here, let me just take a look and see. Um, somebody asked uh, if we could clarify which programs are specifically available to independent contractors. Um, I know we had that in the slides, but I know we went through it quickly. So um, independent contractors can apply for the EIDL and the PPP. Uh, well, let me check, sorry, let me check EIDL. Um, PPP for sure. Uh, yep, self-employed individuals and independent contractors can apply for the EIDL. So the EIDL, the PPP, um, you would not be able to apply for the um, employee retention credit because that is based on you know having uh, employment taxes that are being remitted regularly so for employees um, but then yes for the unemployment assistance so really almost all these programs apply uh, except for the employee retention credit and then the small business debt relief which is you know if you had for some reason that type of um, 504 7a micro loan or something those are typically loans for equipment or something along those lines um, you would qualify as well. And I'm looking at another one here from Nick. Yeah, we answered that one. Okay, got that one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think the hard part for this industry in particular is that um, when the roles changed, a lot of companies were forced to offer W-2 versus us always being 1099 like we used to be years ago. And so that kind of plays into the lack of uh, unemployment that you can get because you are being listed as a W-2, even if you've only worked, you know, five or 10 times for them through that year. So that, that kind of throws a kink into uh, this industry in particular when it comes to disaster loans. Um, I see here, um, somebody asked the PPP is all allocated. Should we apply now? Yes, apply now. Some, some banks are, have cut off and are not taking applications right now. They, I'm hoping they're going to open them back up when they approve the additional funding. There are other banks who are still taking applications um, because they're fairly confident these additional funds are going to get approved. But I think some of the banks that have cut them off is because they have so many people in the queue that missed out on the first round that they're, they're, they're first in line for the next round and they may feel like they have more than they can even get through, where other banks are still taking them in hopes that they can get them all pushed through. So. If you have more than one bank relationship, I would get in touch with those bankers and find out what their queue looks like and what the likelihood is that you can get in line. And I, I, you can't apply to more than one bank, so you'd have to pick, which may be worth talking to the, if you've got a couple bank relationships, talking to them and seeing which one has a higher likelihood of you actually being able to get in line and, and take advantage of the program. And, and I've had I've had clients that have had multiple bank relationships, like Nancy said, and they you know tested the waters to see which bank was going to be more responsive and and on their game when it came to applying for these types of loans. So um, you know go go with go with the fast dog in in something like this to to get ahead of the curve and get your funds. Yeah, if you've been watching the news at all, there were a couple banks that got hit pretty hard in the media because they literally had lots and lots and lots of customers and they were only helping those that actually had business loans or business accounts. Um, so there was a lot of people that got left out in that situation. So that was not the most favorable bank to be trying to work your PPP loan through. Um, I see a question here. I haven't filed my taxes for 2019. I've heard you can use your 2018 return. 
I, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me to hear that, but everything that I've seen and read and have run into so far, if you haven't filed 2019, at least get the information put together. And I, I know not, you know, not everyone feels comfortable putting together a Schedule C for a tax return, but a Schedule C for a tax return look is really essentially an income statement. What's your income and what's all the various expenses of your business? It's pretty much that simple. And even if it isn't in the form of a Schedule C, if, it, if you can put that together, here's all my business income, here's all my business expenses, here's the sort of net that is left for me to pay myself. That's really what they're looking for. And, and I would add to that, Nancy, that it's, I don't think it would hurt, and I agree 100% with what Nancy said, go ahead and pull together your Schedule C for 2019 uh, as best you can using those documents that the, the banks are going to be looking for, those 1099s, uh, those receipts and, and invoices, things like that. I don't think it would hurt to have your 2018 return on deck to support, to support what's going on here. Um, so. I would definitely have it on deck and, and work ahead uh, to get your 2019 Schedule C done. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, looks like there's no more questions. Well, thank you everybody for, for coming today. Thanks, Stephanie. Evie. Did you want to wrap it up, or? Yeah, just thank you to you guys uh, for for doing a free webinar so that we could glean a little more information because it's all so confusing. And we've heard a lot of stories, and we've seen a lot of posts where people have hit brick walls, and it's it's such a frustrating process. So just acknowledgement of that, even from the financial experts, is is <laughs> nice, uh, but also pointing people in a good direction to to poise everyone when there's more money. Uh, is really helpful and I appreciate that. And thanks Bic for bringing this uh, to us as a community and EDE for supplying the information. Um, and it's just, really great to see all your faces. <laughs> I'll just throw one last thing out. Um, we do primarily work with companies on a very kind of recurring monthly basis, but we have tried to field questions from folks that aren't even clients as best we can. We can't promise because we've got to take care of, of our routine clients first. But if you have a question that didn't get answered, um, you can reach out to Steph. She can give you our information or just you know look us up online and reach out. And we'll try to do what we can to answer those. Um, and try to be helpful because I do feel like it, it's gonna take, it takes everyone that we're all in this together kind of thing. So, and, and we just are very passionate about the small business community and wanna see everyone make their way through this well. Thank you. And, and along those lines, we'll have a video of this exact uh, presentation and conversation. Um, and I'll post that as soon as I can uh, later today. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Take Thank good care you. of yourselves.